how does inflation affect your Social Security benefit? Well, here to talk with me about this is Dana Osbach from Sensible Money. Dana, welcome. Hi, Bob. Pleasure to have you here, and it will be a pleasure to have you walk us through this topic, which I know beguiles many people. Yes, it does. Social Security benefits are so complicated, and I get a lot of misunderstanding when I talk to people. I hear a lot of misunderstanding about how inflation affects benefits. And so I thought it might be easiest to start with looking at how your benefits are calculated in the first place. I'm going to share my screen. And the first thing I want to look at is an overview. So when you look at how your Social Security benefits are calculated, it starts with a four-step formula. The first step is the Social Security office looks at your 35 years of highest earnings. Now, what it actually does is indexes those earnings to inflation. And I'm going to walk you through how that works. That results in something called your average index monthly earnings. Once it's been indexed to inflation, it then ranks your highest 35 years. It then runs those average index monthly earnings through a series of bend points so that Social Security is designed to replace a higher portion of the first, let's call it about $1,000 of earnings, and then a lower portion of the bigger chunk of your earnings. So for example, down here, you see 2022 bend points where Social Security would replace 90% of the first 1,024 of earnings and 32% of average index monthly earnings that fell in between 1,025 and 6,172. Now these bend points also are indexed to inflation. Then the last step is you run those average index monthly earnings. You run them through these bend points. It creates something called your primary insurance amount. This is the amount that you are estimated to get at your full retirement age. However, there are going to still be cost of living adjustments that are applied to that, and those aren't factored into this formula yet. And you have to apply other factors. So if we look at your primary insurance amount being what you would get at your full retirement age, if you claim before that, there will be a reduction in your benefits. And if you claim after that, there will be an increase in your benefits. And that increase will be further increased based on cost of living adjustments on the inflation factors. Does does that general overview make sense? Yeah, so far so good. No questions. (laughs) Okay, then we are going to switch over to the actual Social Security website. So they have a lot of information on how this works. The first page we're looking at is the National Average Wage Index. And so if we scroll down, they will explain to you exactly how this is calculated. And you can go back to 1951 and see their National Average Wage Indexing Series. Now, for those people who really want to dig into the details, you can read these two paragraphs for how the formula works, and you can click on this Wage Data tab, and it will take you over to the actual calculation and the percentage increase in these national average wages each year. So here we're starting in 1984, and we can go down, if we go all the way down to 2021, we can see that the national average wages increased 8.89% that year. Now, they also walk you through these examples, which I think are excellent. And so here they're illustrating case A and case B. Now, case A is somebody born in 1961. They are retiring at age 62. Case B is someone a little bit older, not much, born in 1957 and retiring at their normal full retirement age. And in each case, they're assuming the worker had Social Security eligible earnings from 1983 through 2022. So if we look at this, what we see is that person A earned 14249 in nominal dollars in 1983. After applying the indexing factor, when it was indexed up to 2022 levels, that was equivalent to 56639 We can see that person B earned 35000 
1983, and after applying the index factor, that was equivalent to 117.886 in 2022. So, assuming this was the highest 35 years of earnings, those years get totaled, and they get divided by the number of months, and so for person A, we get this average index monthly earnings of 5,052. And for person B, we get 10,503. Now, these numbers get run through what are called bend points. And so Social Security goes on and continues this exact same example. So here we see case A. We see these 5,052 of average index monthly earnings. And the bend points now for someone retiring in 2023 are 1,115. And so that first 1,115 of earnings, you see it multiplied by 0.9. So the formula is designed to replace 90% of that first bend point. The second bend point goes up to 6,721. And so you see Social Security replacing 32% of the earnings that fall um, between the first and second bend point. So person A has a what's called primary insurance amount of 2,263. And that's the, the final number. Person B, we see the same formula. Now, their bend points are different. Why is that? Well, the bend points are based on the year a person attains age 62. And so in this case, I believe this was the 2021 year bend points that are being used. And so again, we see 90% of the first bend point, 32% of the next bend point, and then there's 15% of a, a one additional bend point that's applying in this case. And so we get this primary insurance amount of 3,061. Now here, we're seeing because worker A is eligible in 2023 and also retires in 2023, there are no applicable cost of living adjustments. And so person A is going to get 2,263. But what about person B? They are now already full retirement age. And so here we see that person B is going to get additional cost of living adjustments applied for the years 2019 through 2022. And so instead of getting 3,061, at their age, full retirement age, they're actually going to get 3,627. Now, here's why I think this is important. If you were to look at your Social Security statement and you were 62, for example, and we'll look at a sample Social Security statement. Let's say I'm 62 today and I'm evaluating. Okay, I could get 1,465 or I could wait and get a little bit more or I could wait until age 70 and get even more. Well, these future numbers will have additional increases based on inflation, but that's not reflected on your statement. It can't be reflected on your statement because it hasn't happened yet. It's the future. And so what I see people doing is they will take these numbers and run their own calculation on a yellow pad or in Excel, and they will be underestimating the benefits that they're actually going to get in the future. And that is concerning. I think some people are making an suboptimal decision about when to claim by doing their own calculations, by simply going off these, these numbers on their statement. If we look at the actual uh, history of Social Security cost of living adjustments, that is also on the website. And this will apply once you are starting benefits. So we can see here in the years 2009, um, all the way up really to uh, about 2020, inflation was very tame and there were many years where there was zero increase in the cost of living adjustments for people receiving benefits. Now, here in 2021 and 2022, obviously, we see those benefit increases um, becoming much more significant. Let's look at how this plays out. Another page of the Social Security website shows you 
uh, somebody retiring at 62 versus the various later ages that they could begin benefits. I shouldn't say retiring because just because you retire at 62 doesn't mean you have to start benefits at 62. And if we go down here to the year 2000, this column is their average index monthly earnings. And then the next column is they started at 62, they'd get 1,248. Well, because of inflation today in 2023, they would be getting 2,221. But if they had waited, we come over here, they had, would start at age 70 getting 1,752. Today, they would be getting 3,120. Now, the difference here in this age 62 claiming is $973 a month. The difference here between these two numbers is 1,368 per month. And so when you are delaying benefits, you're gonna get the same percentage increase each year once you're already claiming, but if you waited until a later date, obviously that percentage is of a higher starting number. So for maximum inflation protection, uh, starting later gives you obviously a higher dollar increase each and every year. All right, Bob, is that all clear as mud? <laughs> Claire is mud, and I and I, I even hate to ask you questions that take us back into the weeds. But um, given that Social Security is using two different indexes to calculate your benefit, one the National Wage Index and and then CPI for the other, are there dramatic differences between these two from your perspective? And well, it's kind of interesting. So if we look here at the the cost of living adjustments that apply once you are age 62, those are applying to what's called your primary insurance amount, and they're applying once you are actually receiving benefits, we can again see that there were these years where there, we had many zeros and, and, and pretty tame increases. If we go here to the wage index series and we look at those same numbers, 2008, 2009, well, here we are seeing increases, uh, much more substantial increases than we saw in the COLA, but we also see a negative year in 2009. Now, once you're collecting benefits, they're not going to go backwards, so there, there's not a negative COLA. It can be zero, but it, but it won't um, you know, take benefits away from you. And so, yeah, I think there are some substantial differences. Uh, I think it's important for people to know that inflation is factored in to their benefit calculation and up until age 60 this is how it's factored in it's it's indexing your wages um, based on this formula and then once you are age 62 it's a different calculation now it's this cola that's being applied to that primary insurance amount uh, and increasing your benefits each year right and then on one of the pages, Danny, you showed uh, the factor differences uh, between case A and case B. That is here, case A and case B. And we got to the average index monthly earnings. And then I think you're referring to this page. Uh, scroll down just a bit on the previous page at the, yeah. in, the, in the first row. Or maybe, maybe it's on this page. Uh, scroll up to the first row. Yep. The indexing factor difference. Yes, so this is based on the year you turn 60. And so that's an excellent point. You might think, well, why are there different numbers here? Because this factor is determined based on the year you reach the age of 60, generally two years before your age of eligibility. So assuming your age of eligibility is 62, it would be 60. The reason they state it that way is, let's say you had someone that um, you know, didn't earn enough most of their life to qualify for Social Security, their first age of eligibility might be 63 or 64. But for most people, it's going to be age 60. Uh, if you could jump now again to the Social Security statement, <laughs> uh, the number there, uh, though understated, uh, also is a gross number and not reflective of potentially Part B premiums, WEP and GPO, and certainly not per the possibility of being uh, taxed at 85%. Yes, excellent point. So one 
one factor is you mentioned WEP, the windfall elimination provision, or GPO, the government pension offset. So if you or a spouse worked for an employer where you had wages and did not pay into Social Security, there could be a reduction in either your own benefits or um, if your benefits based on a spouse's, um, there could be a reduction in, in those benefits. And that reduction is not reflected here. And so many people who had uh, worked for a past employer and didn't have Social Security wages uh, withheld during that, that employment period or worked overseas are thinking they're going to get what they see on their statement and then surprised when this other reduction applies. And, and so you would know by going on to the Social Security website, creating your My Social Security account. You can create an account. You'll typically need your cell phone available for authentication. And it will give you your full earnings history. Now, the new Social Security statements don't give you your full earnings history. They are, you know, averaging together these past decades and only giving you the year by year numbers for recent history. But when you create your own account, you can actually download your full earnings history. And if you had years where earnings tax for Social Security were zero, but it would still showing earnings and, and it would, you would see a zero column, but you obviously would know you had earnings that year. Those would be years where perhaps you worked for an employer and didn't pay into Social Security. It would usually be a, a government entity that you worked for. And so then you would need to dig deeper to see if, if GPO or WEP applied to you. You also mentioned taxation. So up to 85% of your benefits are subject to income taxes. And that's a whole other formula that we're not going to get into today. Uh, some people who have very little earnings other than Social Security will not pay income taxes on their benefits at all. And other people generally, um, you know, people who have 50, 60, 70,000 or more of other income in addition to Social Security are going to pay 85 taxes on 85% of their benefits. If you are already on Medicare, you will also see your Medicare Part B premiums uh, deducted from your Social Security benefits. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned that Social Security uses your highest 35 years. People are often told that if they have a lot of zeros to try and keep working to replace those zeros. Yes, I would agree with that. So if you were out of the workforce for many years, if you were, you know, women um, raising children, for example, then getting uh, extra years of earnings in and, and filling up those highest 35 years can be important. The other factor to know is these estimates that you're seeing here, and it will tell you this, that they are based We'll look at it right here. These personalized estimates are based on your earnings to date and assume you continue to earn, and usually it's going to take your last year of earnings until the start of your benefits. So let's say I'm 62 and I'm looking at, at this number and I'm thinking, mm, well, even if I retire now, do I want to wait and, and start benefits till 70? Well, it's going to assume you continue to earn and that is factored into this benefit calculation, but the cost of living adjustment is not factored into this benefit calculation. And this is why we use software when we do these projections. There is a free calculator you can use. It's called Open Social Security, and it's by Mike Piper, P-I-P-E-R, uh, that you can, can do your own calculations. I do recommend that over trying to do them in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, but it, it's important to get that right. So if you're trying to decide, well, I might leave the workforce early, but I might delay the start of my benefits, we actually go in and put each year's of earnings in. And then let's say, you know, the last four years, we might put zeros stating that this person won't be earning anymore, but we still want to let their benefits delay so that we're accumulating um, what are called delayed retirement credits. And we will automatically factor in future cost of living adjustments. Right. It sounds complicated because the other calculation you need to uh, input would be the uh, the bend points. Yes, if you're trying to do it yourself, then you also have to factor in these bend points, and you have to use the year that you turn 62. Those are the bend points that you use. Now, Social Security does provide the whole history of bend points on their website, so you can go back and, and look those all up. Um, but software is great. You don't have to do your own calculations. I know there's people out there that love it. The engineers out there, they love to uh, make their own spreadsheets, but there's so much that you could get wrong. 
and there's some great tools out there that you can go online and you know there's some tools available for a fee that are great also um, maximize my social security by Larry Kutlikoff is an excellent tool and and so there's great tools out there that you can use and and put these numbers in and, and know that you're not going to be missing any of these important factors yeah so we've talked a lot about people perhaps who are W-2 wage earners and maybe their income is rising modestly according to the wage index. What about self-employed people where their wages may be you know, rising and falling dramatically? How do you go about handling that for estimating benefits? Well, the calculation ultimately is the same, right? So if we go back here to, you know, their their earnings history, you know, in these cases that they showed us, these samples, it's kind of nice. These these people make more a little more money each and every year, right? Even in nominal terms. Now, I don't know about you, Bob, but that's not how my earnings history no, no, has no, been. That's been my history. <laughs> Um, I am self-employed and I've had several times in my career where my earnings went to almost zero or certainly got cut in half by or by more than 50%. So that's the life of a self-employed person. And so, um, you know, we will take their actual earnings history and put each year in to the software that we use or if we're projecting forward we have to work with them to come up with what we think would be a, you know, a reasonable estimate. Now, I will say most self-employed people, their earnings tend to stabilize later in their career. So it can be a little bit easier. But you can also have people who left the workforce and decided to start their own consulting firm, you know, perhaps in their late 50s or 60s. And you're absolutely right. Uh, their future income can be all over the place. If we want to be super conservative, we might assume that their actual Social Security taxed earnings are pretty low going forward and will base their benefit estimate on that lower number. And then if they end up earning more, it's just a surprise to the upside. Well, I think I've exhausted all my questions, Dana. I can't think of anything else to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, hopefully this helps at least one or two people understand how inflation affects their benefits. And even more importantly, understand that not all of the factors that they need to consider are, are reflected in these numbers.